Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric, and I'll be talking about my project, which is titled Content Ro Robust Content Fingerprinting for Image Attribution. And my mentors are John Kalamas and Vishy Swaminathan. Uh, brief background on myself. Um, I'm an deep learning intern here at Adobe for the summer, and I'm an incoming PhD uh, at Stanford this fall. In the past, I studied civil engineering um, before making a more recent switch to computer science. Um, I spent the past year um, before Adobe at Facebook Research on their computer vision team, working on image tampering detection for the purposes of finding fake news, which is um, a very relevant topic for my project here at Adobe, uh, which I'm helping out with the Content Authenticity Initiative, uh, or CAI for short. And some background on this project, it's an industry collaboration between New York Times, Adobe, and Twitter to help authenticate content. For the scope of my internship, it's uh, really focusing on helping answer the question of how do we verify the provenance of an image, which is really you know, the origin of the image and it's who created the image, for example. Um, the approach we're taking is to visually trace the provenance of an image from the wild by linking it to a database image retrieval. So we envision a system that can help the photojournalist user um, that might create an image and a once bit content to the users. We track the history and edits the thing. They can then upload that history to Adobe Cloud to then have a pointer that can point to that history. And so when a user um, comes across an image on uh, Twitter or Facebook, they want to know where that image came from, you know, the provenance of that image. You can upload that image to cloud service to retrieve the provenance information for that. Now, in terms of research specifically for this project, what we're interested in creating is a few robust content fingerprint for images. And by fingerprint, I mean, more broadly speaking, essentially features for an image or a unique identifier for the image that satisfies two main criteria, which is the features would be invariant to benign edits, like your padding or compression or rotation, things that might occur uh, when you upload an image to the internet, but still sensitive to semantically important changes to an image like Photoshop images. And so, for example, you'll see here like the original, an image might be uh, photoshopped with the King Kong and next to the mountain. Uh, we want something like that to be far from uh, the original image in this feature space that we're learning, but still have a cluster of benign transforms around the original. So we want to learn features that kind of have those two characteristics. To help us train a model with these features, we're using a data set called Photoshop Battles, uh, and we curated a smaller data set subset of 25,000 image pairs of originals and their Photoshop counterparts. Some with uh, more obvious changes to the Photoshop, but some with really subtle differences in the, in the Photoshop version. So that's the challenge, is to be able to have a unique identifier or fingerprint for an image or, or set of features that can distinguish between um, these fine-grained changes. So I spent the past couple of weeks working with a colleague to benchmark existing algorithms that could be used for our task. Uh, we started off with more classic hashing algorithms and then uh, moved on to more deep learning based algorithms uh, as, as long as um, as well as Adobe's image retrieval service called Stock7. Um, and we used a couple of metrics, um, the first being uh, MAP for image retrieval, which is really just your standard uh, metric for image retrieval um, evaluation. And if you remember, we're, we're also really interested in not just your standard image retrieval, um, but we want it to be robust against Photoshop images. So we have this modified um, version of MAP called MAST MAP that we use that really penalizes essentially uh, when you retrieve an image and you rank the Photoshop image higher than the um, original image uh, or uh, 
or benign edits, we're going to penalize that more essentially. So that to, to help you uh, visualize um, some of the models that we benchmark here, we see that a lot of the models, in particular the, the deep models, do you know pretty pretty well on your standard image retrieval, um, retrieving like images essentially. But when it comes when it comes to retrieving images um, that are not fooled by Photoshop images, you, you see that the metrics drop pretty dramatically. And so um, that's what that's what we want to focus on in this project, which is to close that gap, to increase the mass MAP so that you're not fooled by Photoshop image, images when you're trying to uh, retrieve them. And to help us achieve this goal, we're pursuing the approach of using scene graphs and graph convolutional networks to learn these features. And to give you a sense of what this architecture and pipeline looks like, so you, you have an image that you're going to run through a standard um, object detector, and you're going to create a graph representation of that image, where the nodes are going to be the objects and their visual features for this graph, and the edges will represent the spatial relationship between those objects. So think distances between objects, um, the amount of overlap between objects, uh, that kind of information, that's kind of spatial information. Uh, once you have this graph representation, you can then pass it through a graph convolutional network that will learn to represent the scene uh, of the image in this graph representation um, that we think will be better able to model local object features and their spatial relationships to each other much better um, than your classic classifier that will really focus on global descriptors and not be so good at discriminating between those fine subtle changes that Photoshop images um, typically have. And so we think this approach is um, really exciting and we think it'll work. And so with that, we'll just close off with next steps. Um, we'll finish off with uh, a few more baseline models to, to benchmark. And then we'll really quickly move on to implementing the graph convolutional network that uh, I just described um, and explore different experiments with different training schemes and loss functions. Um, and so with that, I'll just close with um, any questions you might have to clarify. Um, yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Hey, hi, this is Rupesh. Uh, so two questions. Uh, for graph convolution, so I, I guess every node, after graph convolution, you'll, you'll have a representation for every node, right? So how, how do you plan to get a single representation out of it? And the second question is, since you are considering graphs between objects, uh, I guess the kind of edits, like, uh, I mean, in, in one of the examples, a person's gaze was changed, or for example, if the objects are quite small that they are not detected. So, would that be an issue with that? Yeah, those are great questions. So, um, I think some of the newer graph convolutional networks out there are, are able to handle varying amounts of objects in the image, and so you, you don't necessarily need a fixed number of objects to create your graph network. So if you have just one object, for example, or if you have 10, um, you can have varying levels of nodes to represent uh, an image. I, I, hopefully that was your question, or if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, if you have a different question, feel free to... You have varying length of representation? Yeah, I think the, the, the beauty of a graph convolution network is that it's a... Um, it allows you to have varying number of nodes, so which translates to a varying number of objects in the image that you can build a graph representation of. Um, and so what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. So since these are graphs between objects, I mean, the kind of edits where you are making uh, small changes, like the example that you showed in which gaze of a person, gaze of a person was changed. Or, for mm -hmm. example, the object itself is not detected because it's too small. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the, the initial stage of the pipeline is to use uh, a standard object detection. So to capture those really small objects, um, we're going to depend on state-of-the-art models that are just going to be able to capture those small objects. And we think something like a, a mask or CNN or a potentially a, a different object detection model that we can use. Um, will help us really carry the, the weight in terms of finding those small objects. But I think our, our, our focus is um, 
if the, the image's meaning has changed. And so it's usually relevant items that are, are photoshopped. And so we hope that an object detector is going to capture most of the relevant items in the object or in the image, excuse me. Okay, thank Thanks. you, Eric. Uh, 